All right, let's continue to look at counseling session guidelines. We've looked at three so far. We've looked at prayer, listening, number two, and then three, asking the question in praying, is this person saved? I think that's an important question. It keeps the priorities sorted out in the counseling ministry. The Lord can use us so much in that kind of a situation to let the, the challenges or opportunities of life be the avenues to lead to the presentation of the gospel and offering of Christ as Lord and Savior. Very closely related to that is another question that I believe is biblically correct to be asking, and I've personally developed more and more of a habit in this arena as the Lord has worked in my life, and that is, even if in sharing with that person, we have strong indication that they are a disciple of the Lord, there's another question to be asking. Let me put it another way. Maybe you know that person, and you are quite certain from long-standing relationship that they know the Lord, that they are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, here's another question that is very appropriate and fits in the same realm of thinking. As we're listening and praying, praying and listening, and say we're quite certain of their saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another question I like to ask while I'm praying is, and I put it in these words, saved, comma, but, question mark, exclamation, question mark. (laughs) Yes, they're saved, however... Yes, they're a disciple of the Lord, but are they living as a disciple? Are they following the Lord? Are they pressing on after the Lord? Or are they just coasting or drifting or getting into self? And in this day and age, a lot of Christians that are seeking a word of counsel on the formal or informal level are on their own flesh's inclination as well as the encouragement of many other Christians often. They're very much into their own flesh. Which reminds me, a comment, why is it that there's so many of these self-help books, self-help groups and all of that in churches? How is it that in the Christian publishing community there can be tons of books that are self-centered instead of Christ-centered? Well, one reason is There's so much fleshy carnality in the American church. There's an automatic market for it. All this stuff feeds the flesh, appeals to the flesh, entrenches people in the flesh. And often Christians, real disciples in the sense that they do know the Lord and have followed Him some, when their crisis comes, when their problem comes, uh, they're sort of uh, into self. Hey, help me, protect me, uh, fulfill me, actualize me, I'll assert me, all of that. So here's another great question to be asking. Saved, but. But how are they walking? Are they pressing on to know the Lord? Are they following hard after the Lord? If they are not, there's the next priority. The Lord doesn't just want to speak into their perplexity. He doesn't want to just restore a comfort zone. He wants to use whatever they're wrestling with to get them moving on down that path of discipleship. Just like He wants to use the issues of life to get us on the path of discipleship by coming face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. So those who have met the Lord, who are drifting or into self or or sliding back. He wants to use whatever they're struggling with to let them encounter the Lord again in a fresh new call and move to move them on down that path of discipleship. And the scriptures on that, Luke 9.23, you know, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Verses like that are very appropriate. I've turned often through the years to a verse like that 
when discipling one in counseling that I was quite sure was already a believer. Another great two verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2. The call by the mercies of God to lay our lives on the altar of God as a living sacrifice, which is our only reasonable service, and thereby not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Those are great verses to share with a believer who knows the saving, forgiving grace of God, but is not living by the sustaining, liberating, maturing, freeing, transforming grace of God. How can you tell in listening to a person that you know most likely, most certainly is a Christian, how can you tell if they're pressing on as a disciple or if they're into self? Well, as I've put it before, if you hear them talking all the time about the unholy trio, the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. That's the tip-off, number one. Well, I don't like this. Well, they're not treating me right. Well, I, I, and me, me, and mine, and well, as far as myself, you know, and just on and on and on. It's just me, myself, and I. It's like trumpeting out. I'm into self. I am sitting before you, walking according to the flesh. <laughs> now counsel me, you know. That's kind of what's happening. And often that's the situation. We're all vulnerable to that, susceptible, temptable. But especially in our day and age, in our church culture, and just people who live as citizens of our country, it's so much, there's so much selfism and meism and self exaltation and self serving. And it is all sort of given a validation by the ascendancy of the psychological counseling profession. The experts in meology, you know. <laughs> Selfology. They're experts at it. All the theories are built around self, basically. And they're very self-serving. And so people get a lot of encouragement, not only from within, but from without. Their own flesh is crying out, take care of me. <laughs> Bless me, protect me. Give me. And many, sometimes well-intended Christians, are amening them. Yeah, you, you, need to, you, know, you need to do this for yourself, you know. You, you've been giving too much attention to your kids and your husband. You, know? you, you need to, to, to do this for yourself, you know. And, and just start gearing you from the Lord and others into self. And then they come for help and they want you to help them help themselves, you know. <laughs> I like to be praying, Lord, use me to get away from this issue with them that they're harping on, that they want to comfort, protect their own flesh from or in, and help us get right down to discipleship. Because again, I found so often uh, that if, if we even can go beyond the limited issue to the bigger foundational issues, we're helping people not only get through the struggle they're in, but learn how to walk through and face all kinds of challenges and struggles. And discipleship is what it's all about. Another unfolding aspect in a counseling session, early appropriate use of the Word. Early appropriate use of the Word of God. John fourteen twenty six. Before we read that verse, let me tell you another brief story. One day, my buddy John, now pastor at Calvary Chapel, Irvine, he and I were coming out of a counseling session that I had again invited him to sit in on. And after the folks left, the first thing John said to me was, Bob, you sure get people into the Word of God in counseling setting a lot faster than I do. I thought on that just a minute, and I said, John, you know, I get people into the Word a lot quicker than I used to. And I've seen through the years. There's been a, a kind of a tightening of the gap from, from uh, the starting to share together to the time we're in the Word together. 
And I'll tell you, that's what my heart is beating for, praying for, and crying out to God for the most. That is a chance to open the Word of God and directly let the wonderful counselor start counseling. I really see that as our primary role in biblical counseling. is be an instrument through which the Lord can work in such a way that His Word can actually be open and let Him speak directly right into the situation. That's what I'm always aching for and looking for. I may have shared before, but often when I'm praying and listening, uh, years ago I used to write down a lot of details and all about it, and, and not that that's invalid or forbidden, but through the years I got away from that, one, I notice people getting kind of edgy, you know, as, as they're pouring out their heart in your writing. It's like, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> Where's that headed? Into the Sunday bulletin, an insert on the... <laughs> Great opportunity for God to work, you know. <laughs> That's my life. <laughs> and as more time went on, I just stopped writing. But, but I... I did and still do like to have uh, paper or uh, scratch paper or three by five or something handy. And uh, I like to have Bible, pen, and at least a little piece of paper or in my Bible or in my pocket. The only thing I generally write on it anymore is Scripture verses. Because when I'm listening and praying, I'm saying, Lord, what do you want to say to this person? And when the Lord brings to my mind a scripture passage, I count that a direct answer to prayer. It's like the Lord saying, here's what I want to tell them. And I just write it down. And then when that moment comes, as it so often does, sometimes sooner, sometimes later, where the person says, you know, what do you think? Or, or, or what should I do? Or, or does God have a word for me? Whatever they say, I want to just grab the Bible. <laughs> Well, let me tell you what I think. What I think is what this verse says, you know. <laughs> or, or what would you do? Well, here's what I think the Lord would want me to do and you to do. You know, just whatever they say when they're looking for help, just turn it right to the Scriptures. That is the most significant moment, I believe, in the counseling situation. I mean, that's where things, in an amazing way, really start popping and happening. Because the Word is living and sharp and quick and powerful and and used by the Spirit, it's as though the wonderful counselor himself is right there just ministering to that person. The reason I like to use John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, by the way, that word helper could also be translated counselor, comforter. It's one of those two Greek words that can be translated, counselor or comforter. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. If we are going to use the Word of God in counseling, which we must if we're going to do it God's way, we've got to be letting the Word be planted in our hearts. I believe it's right to desire an early appropriate use of the Word of God. I think both, both of those words are significant, early and appropriate. As early as we can, looking for the opportunity, but appropriate, you know, not, not sitting there with our Bible in hand as they come in and we're ready to just jump all over them. Now, I'm not saying God would never do that. You know, that, that may be just what that situation needs, but as a methodology, you know, it's, yeah, I've been thinking about you, praying about you. <laughs> Sit down, grab pencil and paper, you know. <laughs> if I got a word for you. <laughs> you know, it, it, it maybe could happen that, I mean, well, maybe anything. God can work any way He wants. And sometimes in the most unusual ways. A way you would never apply maybe in a thousand other settings. But can be just what God wants to do there. But early, but appropriate, you know. Early, you're looking for that chance, but appropriate. You know, you're not ramming it on their throat. And, and you have time to show you care, you listen, you want to learn, and you want to pray. But I believe an early appropriate use of the Word of God is pleasing in the sight of the Lord to be pressing toward in prayer, in our heart, in our thinking, in our desire. I mean, so often I feel like, like 
Now, this is an overstatement, but so often I feel like up until that moment, a lot of it is almost like, well, without it, it would be waste. You know what I mean? That overstates it. I, I mean, no, God's working between hearts and on hearts and all that. And, and I don't want to be misunderstood, but this moment is so significant, you know, that the others kind of like, well, you know, that was just so this can begin to happen. That's how important I think it is. And again, we want to speak the truth in love. We're not ramming the word down people's throats. We're not laying the law on people. Unless, of course, if they're very rebellious, we better be ready to lay the law on them. Because the law is for the rebellious and the insubordinate. 1 Timothy 1, 7, 8, and 9. Early appropriate use of the word. But if we're going to be used that way, what needs to be happening? We need to be taking the word into our lives. We need to be letting the Holy Spirit teaching us all these things of the words of the Lord. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The Holy Spirit teaching us the word and then bringing it to our remembrance when it's needed. Some believers unnecessarily, sadly, needlessly disqualify themselves from counseling ministry too often, too quick, too soon. Because they think they don't have, uh, they might say, the memory for it. Oh, I can't remember all those verses and apply them to all the categories. And, you know, it's, it's too much to remember. I really don't believe that the counseling ministry is all about memory. Now, if you, if you have been given by God a great memory, praise God, He can use it. But I don't think any place in the Word of God are we told that you have to have a great memory to be used in personal ministry. What we need to do is have a growing relationship with the great God and get into this great word of His and let it get into us and then be available. If we're not taking it in, letting Him teach it to us, it's not there for Him to bring to our remembrance. But He's willing to take the role of teaching and bringing to our remembrance. If we let Him teach the word to us, you know, really make it important in our lives then in certain situations, the Spirit of the Lord will just bring it to mind. I mean, it's amazing the way that works. Again, it's such a living spiritual dynamic. Again, you don't want to bring it down to some uh, rote procedure. It's just God at work. But we want to be putting God's Word in our heart. James 1.21, meekly receiving the implanted Word. Psalm 119.11, Your Word have I hid in my heart. We want to be bringing it in then the Spirit of God will bring it up at the right moments. It's part of His great ministry to us. We can depend on that, count on that, rely upon that. The next issue, needed response or action. Next unfolding aspect of a counseling situation. Watching for needed responses or actions. Some are real obvious, like Matthew 5, 22 and 23. 23 and 24. Therefore, Jesus said, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. You know, if we're counseling someone and they're into this great service of God, but they're kind of impeded or bothered or hassled in it by this nagging reminder that they have a brother who rightly has something against them and they come for our counsel, you know, well, oh, this is going to be a tough one, you know. We might need a year or so of therapy before we ever get down to the bottom of this. No, you just tell them, hey, shift your attention from that project, that service that you're engaged in. Not that it's wrong, not that you have to leave it forever. Just focus your attention on straightening that thing out with your brother. And often in counseling situations, the Word has spoken so much into that that we can just be watching for those. You know, and, and, and perhaps in the, some ways, if we are watching, we will uh, maybe be helping people in one or two uh, times of counseling them, whereby the trend uh, in our culture and in the church today is to stretch everything out and on and, you know. It's like every issue it comes with a guaranteed six month, 12 month, 18 month, 24 months of, well, they don't even call it counseling often, it's therapy. Well, on some issues, maybe one time sitting down together. 
I'm not saying everybody has to be exactly like Pastor Romaine over at Costa Mesa. He's kind of <laughs> legendary on on being the one-stop shopping does all at the counseling session, you know. And praise God, God's used him to touch, <laughs> touch multitudes of lives. Uh, and but I'm not I'm not saying that we've got to copycat that. There's only one Romaine, you know, <laughs> and uh, but others might be more abrupt than 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 others in counseling. But a lot of us can shorten a lot of it probably. Just by watching for those things the Lord has spoken right into. And when they share and the Lord has spoken, you just share with them. There's no mystery here. You don't need to get into your past or, or you know, maybe something that you did to your dog caused this or, you know, or, or that thing you didn't get when you were five years old for your birthday. You know, look, you want to serve God, but you, there's this problem. There's, this, you know, this, person has something against you, uh, you can't change it, but you can sure be sure you're not the ongoing cause of whatever remains. They might not receive it. They might not respond. Fine, then you're free to just press on right back with you know, your service and all that. Watch for things like that. You know, a man comes in and sits down with you and tells you that he's, his life's just in great turmoil because he's been cheating on his wife for 12 months and he asks you what he should do. You don't have to say, uh, you know, give me two weeks to pray on and come back. You know? <laughs> well, you've been doing that how long? Oh, well, you, you need at least three years of therapy before we can even get into any action steps, you know. <laughs> it's, it's not that mysterious. You've been doing what, you scoundrel? God have mercy on you. I think... Right now would be a time to fall on your face before God, you know? Right now. Right now. The only thing better would have been to do it six months ago. And uh, when you're done, you probably ought to go home and do the same before your wife. What? <laughs> well, she might not respond the way I want her to. Yeah, but she might respond the way God wants her to. And we'll see how God wants to respond, you know? <laughs> Kick in the pants or astounding measures of mercy and forgiveness. Yeah, but she might not let me back in the house. She, she might not want me in her life. Well, you know, she actually has that option before God. And she can seek God on that. You can't make it happen one way or the other. Either way, that's where you ought to be. And who knows? She might have mercy on you. She might have mercy on you. I think God wants us to be watching in counseling situations for things God has spoken right into in His Word. seems like the whole thing in the counseling field now is make everything a great mystery. It's like you're hunting hidden clues. They're usually in and back, you know. (laughs) And so many issues, God has just spoken on them. People are unaccustomed to speaking straightforward to each other. You know, it's hiding and, and restating and redefining and making less of sin and, and less of righteousness and more of self. And often in counseling, I believe the Lord wants us to be alert for needed response or action. I've been with folks in counseling situations that are amazingly gifted at that. The Lord has made me much more forthright in counseling ministry and things like that than I was when I started out. I was probably Dr. Mealy Mouth when I started out, you know. Hey, we can work something out on everything, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I've been with some who are just astoundingly gifted at it or have learned, you know, and matured and they have been listening to God and they see and they just speak. And in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of God, things begin to change rapidly or at least you know exactly where the issues are. And God can use us that way. So needed response or action. Good to be watching for them. Someone might need to immediately confess or repent or seek forgiveness, or offer forgiveness. Next, homework. Homework. And 1 Peter 2.2 2 and Hebrews 5.13 and 14, I think make it clear, we're not talking about busy work. Not just something to look like we're attacking this thing or getting at it. But something to take home in the Word, to work on before God in prayer and seeking. Particularly if I've been with someone and they've been sharing and pouring out their heart, I've been listening and praying and I've written down five or six passages maybe. 
and they ask, you know, what I think, and I begin to share these, and, you know, time goes on, you realize that you know, they say they need to go, or it just seems like, you know, you're, you both wore each other out. <laughs> uh, you know, there might be two or three or four passages left. I like to just say, if they say, you know, can we get together again on this? I like to say, yeah, and you know what? Why don't you take these and be praying in them? I mean, really consistently seeking God. I think God wants to speak through these passages. That's what I'm talking about. Homework. Something to take home to help get in the Word, to hear from the Lord. Then you get together again, that's what you talk about. What did the Lord show you in those verses? Hey, let's go over them together. 1 Peter 2.2 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. The Word of God is pure spiritual milk and Often people need to grow up in and grow out of their situations. And the Word of God is there to assist them. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food, meat, belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Not only the milk of the Word, but the meat of the Word. The meat here especially is shown to be the things about Christ as our great high priest. That's real growing up, maturing, let us go on to perfection. Chapter 6, verse 1 kind of food. Reading the Word to find out who Christ is, what He's done, what He's doing now on our behalf. Letting people drink and chew on the Word of God between times with them. And then, last prayer. And that's purposefully a repeat from the first one. It was prayer, Philippians 4, 6. Last pray, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Certainly fits the counseling ministry to be those who want to pray without ceasing. Pray before we meet with folks. Pray with them when we're together. Exhort and encourage them to pray. Pray as we depart. And pray for one another while we're apart. I mean, that just fits the biblical counseling ministry. It keeps our hope resting on the one who is the counselor. Now, this is not exhaustive, but I really believe that it is, uh, though somewhat brief, it has a significant measure of fullness to it. If we just walk in these things in our counseling ministry, the Lord will be adding other unfolding aspects, you know, that will become increasingly important in our ministry personally as the years go by. But these are a a great place to uh, pray and think with the Lord to build. Let me, at the bottom of our last page, share a concluding word, a final exhortation, based on some scriptures that we've looked at. Isaiah 9, 6. That wonderful, wonderful passage. And His name shall be called... Wonderful Counselor. What we've been looking at throughout this course is this glorious truth that in the kingdom of God, man is not the counselor. God the Son, by the work of the Holy Spirit, is our wonderful counselor. May that shape our counseling ministries. May it shape our perspective on biblical counseling. That the Lord is the counselor. And in light of that, may we be those who respond in a Hebrews 12, 2 kind of a way. Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. When we need counsel, we want to characteristically, habitually, be looking to the Lord Jesus Christ and in His Word to counsel us. When others come to us for counsel, we want to increasingly, habitually, be pointing them to the Lord, urging them, look to the Lord, get in the Word, I'll get in the Word with you. Let's search out the Lord, the mind of the Lord, the Word of the Lord. Let's be looking to the Lord. Oh, how desperately we need that in these days. People in the culture and people in the churches are looking to human experts instead of to the Lord Jesus Christ. Understandable in the world, but tragic when it comes into the church. This is the Lord God Almighty creator of us all and redeemer of his people shouldn't we look to him 
for all of the issues of our lives? I mean, it just makes perfect biblical sense. There's a lot of nonsense of the flesh in the church world, and we don't want to contribute to it. We even want to be salt and light to see the church move out of it and see people looking unto Jesus. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. Boy, that creates a lot of counseling ministry right there. The fact that the Christian life is a race that needs to be run with endurance. A lot of us feel worn out a lot of times on the track. (laughs) And we're turning to one another for help and encouragement. How are we going to help each other press on down the track? If we don't encourage and help one another to look unto Jesus... We'll stagger on our face and make no progress down the track. Or we'll even be tempted to drift off the track. We need to be looking to Jesus who authored faith in us, you know, by presenting himself to us in the gospel. Now he wants to perfect our faith, mold it, shape it, build it, deepen it, strengthen it. How? By looking unto him, getting to know him, learning to trust him, letting him work in our lives as faithful and true and trustworthy so we will trust him more. That should be the very shape of our counseling ministry. Then John 8, 31 and 32. John 8, 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There is so much out there in the religious church counseling arena, so-called Christian psychological counseling and counseling clinics and trained psychological church staff members or referring to the Christian psychiatrist and all. There's so much that's going on in the church world that is not built on, permeated with, and in line with the truth. God's people need to know the truth because only the truth sets people free. What truth? The truth of the Word of God. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. People who live in the Word of God, they're really walking a path of discipleship, and they get to know the truth of the Word, and the truth of the Word liberates their lives from crazy thinking, bondage of bad thinking, bondage of bad talking, bondage of bad behaving, bondage of bad relating, bondage of bad priorities. The truth just sets us free more and more and more from that stuff. And there is so much that's going on in the church world that is not the truth. It's just full of subtle human compromises, even lies and myths. And may the Lord stir our hearts to have a passion for the truth, want to be counseled by it, and want to counsel with nothing other than the truth of the Word of God. Now to be doing that, we'll certainly want to be Bereans like Acts 17.11. Way back down the road, I'd hear a counseling theory, and I'd think, oh, sounds pretty good to me. I'll, you know, I'll try it, or I'll recommend it to someone. Boy, more and more I hear it, I just want to sift it through the tightest sieve of the Word of God, you know. Well, let's let's see. Let's see. And I think that's what Acts 17 is all about. These, at Berea, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Boy, you read First and Second Thessalonians, spiritually speaking, those were noble-minded people. They received the Word of God for what it is, the Word of God and not the Word of man. They began to change their lives. I mean, we're not comparing good and bad here. We're comparing great with greater. You know? Those in Thessalonica, they were spiritually noble. But these in Berea were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the Word with all readiness, that's also what they did in Thessalonica. And searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things are so. These things called Christian counseling uh, literature, theory, approach. Let's see if these things are so. You know, Let's have that kind of a mind. Let's just see if they're so. No one's harmed in that if we do it with the right attitude only can be help for us all. You know? Oh, let me tell you this great new idea, this great new theory. 
Oh, it's just touching lives everywhere. Well, now wait a minute. Is it just getting crowds and filling appointment books? Or is it really doing what God wants to do? Oh yeah, it's just the greatest. Well, let's hear about it. Well, it's all about getting the other half of your brain to work. Oh. Oh. Oh, wow, yeah. The prophets wrote about that numerous times. <laughs> it's all they could talk about. <laughs> let's just see if these things are so, you know. And as far as the theories and ideas of man, I have become a radical skeptic. Prove it to me by the Word of God. Not in a nasty, mean way, but, but very stubborn. In a very stubborn way. Show me in the Word. If it's in there, praise God. If it's not, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, I don't want anything to do with it. In fact, I want to warn against it. I want to be a spiritually noble-minded Berean. Testimony, I spent too many years as a young believer without this noble mind, even a fleeting thought in my Christian life. I spent too many years, I would say five of the 25 that I pastored, I spent five with never an interest in being this noble-minded. In fact, I was very careful to avoid such things. Ever inferring that something might be wrong or someone might be wrong or that I could say this is right and that's wrong. Hey, don't judge. Hey, don't be negative. That's a smoke screen. Yeah, we don't want to be judgmental. We don't want to let negativism be our way of life, but we do want to be noble Bereans. As we take in everything that's out there in the church world, and boy, there is a lot out there, some of it, even the world snickers at and is embarrassed. And the church is plowing on, you know, like, well, we got the answers from Freud and Jung and Maslow and the rest. Let's search the scriptures daily. Let's really be in the Word measuring all these counseling ideas to find out whether these things are accurate. And listen, if they were doing that with the Apostle Paul, and that was noble-minded as he preached the Word, don't you think we ought to be doing it heavy-duty? with theoreticians and clinicians and, and interns and psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, and all the other gists. <laughs> you know, let's just see if this is so. Let's just see. We need noble-minded Bereans this day. May the Lord make us that kind of a counselor. Not just grabbing the kind of, hey, what's hot, what's popular, and what seems to work, or what people are interested in, Personally, I have no interest in that. I mean zero anymore. I want to know, does what you're suggesting fit the Word of God? In fact, let's start another way. Let's just find in the Word what people need. And then let the theories of man buck up against that. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Well, that's kind of the heart of the whole thing. If our heart's set on him and he's counseling us and we pass it on to others... Ultimately, we'll be counseling God's way and not man's way. And I've shared before my heart pretty openly. I think we desperately need something more than a counseling revival. We need a spiritual reformation like 400 years ago, you know, to come heavy into the church. And God is able, and may we be willing to be used. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for giving us these weeks, these hours of study in this course. We thank you for the Word of God and what it, what it, well, it's the perfect, perfect text and more than a text. It's a love letter from heaven to our hearts. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge you as our wonderful counselor and we want to be those who are looking to Jesus, pointing people to Jesus as the wonderful counselor. Men and women who live by, stand on, and counsel from the truth of the Word of God and our noble Bereans measuring everything out there in the counseling ministry by what the Word of God says. Lord, raise up an army like that throughout the church world. Forgive us for our attraction to the ways of man, our fleshy, self-serving delight to take man's way and not God's way. Forgive us for any contribution in that, Lord, and use us now to call the church in your direction. And just do a wonderful work in these days when so many, many hearts are troubled, burdened, and seeking help. May we give them what you have for them and not man, we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.